Okay. Josh, you're going to be introducing yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. One minute.
And so when I think of this piece, I think of really, really hot weather. Maybe not as hot, maybe definitely more hot than it is here right now. Music kind of come alive. So we're going to define what is musicality. 
we're going to talk about how we harness our musicality and our musicality potential. Um, I could get into a little bit of a story of where this kind of all comes from. And I want to talk about how we apply it to our own playing, how we harness this idea of musical potential and applying it in real context of music. How we practice it is obviously important. And most importantly, how do we self-evaluate for continual improvement in our own musical development? So basically, I know that's a lot of text. That's a lot of big words. So where this really kind of comes from is when I was in my undergrad, and even a little bit into my master's too, um, I had a really, really fantastic uh, group of teachers, my mentors, that would always kind of tell me when I would play a piece, I'd get an assignment, and I would learn it, and they would say, okay, play it to me musically now. And it always kind of dumbfounded me for a while because I would be working on notes and rhythms and playing everything accurately, looking at the, the dots on the page, so to speak. And my teacher would just say, Justin, play it musically. And it would always, quite honestly, really, really frustrate me because I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I just spent this whole week trying to learn this piece, spent hours in, in, in my room, my little room, my dorm room, you know, practicing, and you're telling me to play it musically. Like, what does that even mean? And not only until my more recent years of really kind of focusing outside of school and applying these types of things that I'm going to talk about today is where, where I really think that I, I harnessed my musical potential, I should say. And I should also note that it's, it's not a, uh, a formula that just makes you arrive to the destination. It's a continual kind of improvement thing. And I think as we age as humans, the more experiences that we obtain, the more life experience that we obtain, obtain the more these things start to come out, the more expressive that we can make our music and our playing. And it can be also applicable to other types of art forms too, not specifically just music. Okay, so one of the things that I want to kind of talk about is how to like build an intentional practice regimen to be able to utilize these things effectively. Let's say you have 10 minutes a day to practice. 10 minutes may not be a lot, but we can be very effective in how we use that. And we're going to go through this collectively in a minute. Um, but this is again the idea of how to build these things so that way, when we're on our own, we have time to practice, or whatever we may be working on, is how we can utilize that time effectively to make the most of the time that we may have allotted for ourselves. <coughs> most important thing out of this whole interpretation and this whole presentation is how to set realistic and attainable goals. I think one of the things that I, that I had when I was in my, uh, my undergrad was the fact that I wanted to play these pieces that were like, just ridiculously outside of my current level and ability. Um, and a lot of the times, especially in music or you know uh, any type of music related playing, whether that be piano, guitar, violin, drums, percussion, whatever it may be, is there's certain paths to obtain the really, really big pieces, right? So it's like if you're teaching a baby to walk. You don't teach a baby to walk before it can crawl, you know? You can't teach the baby to say a bunch of sentences before you say a little letters at a time, right? So you have to have to do everything within a process. So again, setting realistic and attainable goals. Now, this was the big thing uh, that was a big learning experience for me was how to impl implement our musicality within to our repertoire. I think a lot of the times when it comes to music-based learning, we learn our pieces and we learn the rhythms, the dots on the page, as I said earlier but we think of musicality as a secondary thought. So what ends up happening is after we start to learn a piece, we learn everything, and then we go back to start adding in musicality into our pieces. My whole goal as a player and as a teacher in kind of like presenting this information is to be able to do it right from square one. As I'm working through a piece and as I'm learning it, I want to harness the musicality right from the beginning and not thinking about it as a secondary thought. A lot of the times in classical guitar playing, there's kind of these two different camps. There's players that play very mechanically and, and very just much on the page, no expression, not a lot of interpretation. And then there's players where I tend to be gravitate more, my style towards more, which is playing it more expressively and adding in that humanistic quality. So this includes timbre, phrasings, 
dynamics and articulation. So I'm going to grab the guitar here a little bit, and I want to talk about how we can kind of start to implement these in our playing. And again, these are also things that are not just exclusive to guitar playing. Um, they can be on any other instruments too, or dancing. So let me grab the guitar here real quick. Here. Can you on it? Yes. Okay, so firstly, I want to talk about the idea of timbre. So the guitar is such an interesting instrument because we have a huge variety of tonal color and tonal possibility, especially with just an acoustic classical guitar like this. And we'll have some diagrams up here in a minute that will also facilitate this a little bit further to kind of follow along. Um, but timbre is really just the idea of the tonal variety. So for example, if I take a little scale phrase such as, uh, if I play this up more in position, meaning my hand is closer towards the actual fretboard, I achieve a much sweeter sound. Almost cello-like, almost vocal-like. As I start to kind of move my fingers down, I start to get more of a brighter, grassier sound. So just by moving my right hand in the placement of this, depending on the piece that I might be playing, or depending on my, maybe what the piece might call for, I might decide to play that phrase if I want it to really stand out and be punchy. If I want it to be more lyrical and sweet, So, phrasing in a simple way is just how I present the musical statement and I express it in multiple different ways. Like, I can play that line very, very what we call rubato, which is very open-ended and kind of free. Almost like loss of um, tempo. So if I play this, that same line, but I go... Now I'm being very, very free and kind of expressive with the interpretation of how I'm playing that line. And then I can also play it fast, right? The phrasing of that. The next step in this, this idea of adding in musicality within our own playing is the idea of dynamics. So dynamics, simply put, is just the idea of how loud or soft I may play something. And again, depending on the piece, that's going to dictate whether or not I decide to play it more loud decide to play it more soft. It's very much um, based on the, the type of music that you're playing. If I'm playing something that's a little bit more assertive and aggressive, then I'm not going to play it soft. I might be more out front with it and more um, present in the moment. And then lastly, articulation is just a simple way of how I actually execute the note, how I play it. And again, there's going to be more diagrams to, to kind of go over this a little bit more in detail so you can kind of see how it looks visually. Um, but it, uh, basically, there's like two kind of uh, camps that are kind of dealing with articulation. There is um, legato, and then there's staccato. So staccato is the idea of when the notes are very much like short and detached, kind of punchy. Ba, 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 ba. So very kind of almost like cookie cutter. Da, da, da. And the legato is more interconnected, more lyrical. Da, da. Dun, dun. So it's more interconnected, almost kind of each note runs into the next. So with the same exact notes that I'm playing here, if I was to play this staccato, short and detached, legato, each note is slowly blending. So collectively, if we put all of these 
in use, maybe not all at the same time simultaneously, but as a player, we can decide whether or not we want to pull something in or pull something out. And it really, really brings out the expression in the musicality within your playing. So, if we can continue down the line here, the whole idea is how we're going to end up putting it all together. And we're going to have some examples of this in a moment. So this is something that I kind of touched base on earlier. So we want to consider musicality as a priority and not as an afterthought. We want to begin learning our pieces with musicality from the beginning. Obviously, there has to be a little bit of technical development in the beginning to, in order to execute this and facilitate it fluidly. But, if you implement these ideas into your technique from the beginning, then when you're playing your repertoire and you're playing your pieces, they immediately come out musical. I listen to a lot of classical guitar players, a lot of fantastic players. And I've gone to several different concerts. And I won't name names, but... A lot of the time, I am very much in Camp B. Camp A is very much mechanical players. Camp B is more the human, humanistic, expressive players. And why I gravitate towards those the most is, again, it's the most human, humanistic quality. The guitar for just strings of wood and glue can be one of the most, if not the most, lyrical type of instruments out there, based on the fact that we have all these things that we can include, the timbre, the phrasing, the dynamics and the articulation. And so when my teacher, when I was studying, would tell me just to play it musically, I finally had the light bulb moment where I realized the things that he was trying to tell me was saying, okay, these are the things that you need to add into your playing. Consider when you make those musical choices of when you want to use specific timbres, when you want to use specific phrasing, specific dynamics, and ultimately how you articulate it. So, I want to get into some of these a little bit more specifically. So, <clears throat> here is kind of like a dynamics note velocity chart. Now, some of these might be familiar if you're looking at different types of musical scores. So, these on the left hand side are like piano, pianissimo, mezzo forte, mezzo piano forte, double forte, triple forte. It's a scale of how loud or soft something gets. And again, we, as the players, make those choices on how we are articulating it. If I play a really, really common song that everybody knows, and I play it very soft, and then I play it very, very loud, if I articulate it different, yes, it's the same piece that everybody knows, but now I've almost made it a brand new piece. I've articulated it in a fashion where it's like, oh, now it's fresh. A lot of the times in classical guitar playing, the pieces that we play, especially the pieces that we just played here, are played by hundreds of thousands of players. The difference is, as a player, is how can I bring that piece that everyone's played that's hundreds of years old, but make it sound fresh? That is my goal as a musician, is I want to make my music sound almost as if it's originally being heard for the first time. And I think that's really the goal here with the idea of the intentionality of musicality. On the left-hand side here, on your right, will be an articulation of how to play the same note. This is just a, this, the, the note doesn't even matter. It's just the different phrasings of articulations. So we have like different staccatos. We have more sustained. We have accented notes. Now, some of these, depending again on the piece that you may be playing, they could be different. It's just a variable. And also, depending on it, each player might have a little bit of an interpretation difference on how they might play that staccato. If that staccato is immediately decayed, or it's it's all very, very dependent. Um, and so then again, uh, the, the, the dynamics, depending on, on how, how it's um, written into the score, it could be played at a whisper, in almost a whisper, softer than a speaking voice, louder than a speaking voice, speaking loud, or possibly even yelling depending again on the nature of the piece. So I want to talk a little bit about the hand position of the timbre, which we kind of already touched base on this a little bit. Um, but I think it is worthwhile to see this in a diagram. 
So this is not just applicable to guitar, too. This, this can also be applied to other instruments also, but on the guitar, it's very visually satisfying because we have normal position where a lot of the times the right hand is just directly behind the sound hole just a little bit. That's just normal hand position. Then we have what we call ponticello, which is very much back towards the bridge. That's where you get that more bright, brassier kind of uh, gritty kind of attack. And then you have tasso, which is your more sweeter, more lyrical type of sound. So when we get into the playing examples in a second, we'll do this, we'll do this together. Um, so you can see how just by moving the right hand position, how much of a difference in tone, tone quality that you can achieve and how it really does change the overall taste of the piece. So one thing that my teacher started to kind of add into my playing, so this is not my idea exclusively, this is really where I got this from, was my teacher. Um, was the idea of applying musicality to scales. A lot of the times we do scale practice as a technical drill, right? And we're just going through them, going through them, going through them, and you're kind of like, your mind's not really paying attention to it, so you're like, oh, I'm just working the fingers just to work the fingers. Well, why do we think that way? It's kind of silly. So, in my opinion, if we can start to apply musicality within our scales, then we're really kind of like achieving two things at one time, which is really, 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 really effective. We're just talking about how to apply musicality to scales. I'm glad you brought your guitars. So, anyhow, as we're kind of going through this, the idea is that when you're playing through a scale, we're not just sitting there actively just practicing it for the sake of practicing it. We're applying it within those musicality things that we discussed earlier. So, let me pull this all the way up here. So, this is just a C major scale. It really doesn't matter the collection of the notes, right? So what we're really trying to, again, achieve here is just applying it in any kind of select pitches. Like I said, the scale is not even, not even the most important thing at this point. So like we had talked about earlier with articulation, timbre, uh, dynamics, and uh, like hand position like that, I would just practice my scales. And these particular rhythms, and I'm just going to use the C major scale as an example, as a bass line. Um, and I'm going to try to play that scale in as many different ways to bring out the musicality. So again, that's the phrasing, that's the articulation, that's the dynamics, and that's the timbre. So maybe, for the sake of this right now, maybe I just start with one, and then I'll slowly start to implement them. So maybe in the beginning I'll just focus on the dynamics. So I'm going to take this position of the C major scale, and I'm going to apply it as as quiet, almost like not even audible. Play a game with yourself. How quiet can you make it? It's almost not even audible. Slowly, I'm going to start to turn up the volume. Still pretty subtle. A little bit louder. A little bit louder. Now maybe I'm getting to my full volume. So now I have achieved musicality within my scales. Now you probably never practice your scales that way. You probably sit there with the metronome. <laughs> One and two and three and four and da 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 da, and you're sitting there, blah blah blah, not even paying attention. We need to be intentional about our practice with that. So that's dynamics, right? Okay, and, and I was probably just doing that really like in, in quarter notes or eighth note rhythms. If I was really going through this very intentional, just for the sake of time, um, and I won't go through every part of it, but I would sit here and I'd say, okay, I'm going to do this in quarter notes, and I'm going to just do it in dynamics, really, really quietly and loudly. Maybe when I get to the top of the scale, I start to get to the highest point. So just by adjusting my right hand, I can make a really, really big difference. 
So maybe as I'm playing up that scale, I start to slowly move my hand back to the bridge to achieve those different tone colors. Pretty cool, right? And that's all the idea of the timbre. Now, these on the left hand side are just different rhythmical variations that you can apply this to. So we're kind of doing the quarter notes and the eighth notes a little bit, but maybe I will do like a dotted eighth to a sixteenth note. And that's kind of like that, almost like, uh, kind of like horse gallop. Dot, 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 dot. One, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four. So if I do that in my scale two, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, one, uh, two, I'm achieving that by, and I know you guys didn't see this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a little bit just so that we can, so you can get a visual reference of what we're talking about here. So that's what I was talking about earlier with just the difference of the hand position and the timbre. These are just different, three different positions of that. And then where do we see this? Oh, right here. Talking about the timbre, the phrasing, the dynamics, and the articulation. So timbre basically meaning like the tone, the tone color of it the phrasing in it, how I actually play it, the dynamics of it, how soft or loud I may play it, and the articulation, meaning the way that I'm accenting those notes. So if you have your guitars here, let's get them out, because I want to apply this to some music that we might all hopefully are familiar with. So let's get your guitars out. And if any of you have ever worked through um, the Mel Bay series. This comes exactly from Mel Bay. I've actually, this is like, I've taught this particular piece quite a bit. Um, and so when you're looking at this, this is very, very bare bones. There's no indication of articulation. There's no indication of dynamics. Nothing. It's just like, okay, well, what do I get to do with it? That's very liberating and free as the player, because I might look at that and I say, okay. I can put this any way that I really want, right? So, for example, and we'll do this together here in a moment, but I'm just going to take maybe the first four measures of Ode to Joy, and I'm going to play it a couple different ways to show you how you can take something and almost make it be like an entirely new piece, and then we'll do some playing together here. So I'm just going to take the main phrase here, and I'm going to play it just very, very lyrical and almost just like song-like as if I'm singing it. Pretty nice. Kind of flat dynamic. But what if I start to add in those dynamics? What if I try to play it really, really aggressive and loud and bright? It's like almost three different pieces, right? It's the same piece, but now I've treated it as almost if it's something entirely new. And if I continue to go on, and if I continue, you're like, okay, now I've really made something, I've, I've made a statement with this. So, what I kind of like everyone to kind of do is I encourage you to kind of like look through your pieces and when you're working through something, you know, there's never like a one size fits all approach. Depending on my mood, maybe I'm feeling a little hostile, maybe maybe someone cut me off as as, as I was driving here. I'm a little I'm a little frazzled, right? So I'm gonna be a little bit more assertive with my playing. I don't know, maybe last night I had a really, really great dinner with some friends and family or something, and I'm feeling like, ah, oh, just in this really, really tranquil state. So depending on your mood, that's going to affect how you play this. Um, I'm assuming that most people are all familiar with this piece, I would imagine so. So let's grab our guitars, and let's try this together. Let's just take the first couple lines here. Um, so we have E, E, F, G, G, F, E, D, C, C, D, D, E, D. And I want to see if we can play it as quietly as possible, right? 
So it's almost as if we're not even going to be able to hear. Like, imagine it's like it's really late at night, folks are off to bed, you're in your bedroom, you're practicing, they say, put the guitar away, we're going to bed, and you're like, no, I want to practice 10 more minutes, right? But really, really, really quiet. So let's try this together. Really, really nice and slow. One, two, ready, go quiet. Now, I know I'm kind of making you kind of sight read on the spot, but the thing is, is we can try this, and maybe we'll do this just with like open strings for the minute here, with no, with, with no credit here. Maybe we just take all of the open strings, and we're going to do two notes on each string, as such. Let's say that we're going to do this really, really, really quietly, and we're just going to do all open strings. Let's try this together. We're going to do two strokes on each string. Try it together. Yeah, let's try it together. Like this? Really, really quietly. See if you can go quieter than your neighbor. That's nice. One, two, three, It's almost more difficult to be quieter than it is to be louder. Okay, so let's do the same thing again, but let's take the volume up a little bit more. So let's say that we're kind of doing it as a soft kind of whisper. Let's try that together. So just two on each string. One, two, three. different 
type of phrasing, and I've really kind of held your attention. I work with a lot of really, really young kids, and um, <laughs> it's always really funny to me because I always have to be very, um, uh, I have to always be very in the right mindset to keep to keep a young kid's attention. And so I, I had this idea that if I was to be, you know, expressing a story to a young kid, and it was a storybook, and I had to read for 15 minutes, and I said. You know, once upon a time, there was a king and a queen, and da 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 this. It's like their attention span's gone. But if I articulate and I say, once upon a time, there was a king and a queen, and they lived in a castle far, far away. Now it's like, that kid, I got that kid's attention. We've got to do that the same way we are with music, right? It's so like, if you have that inflection in your voice and that articulation, you're going to be, um, you're going to have someone's attention. And if I say, good morning, everybody, well, I woke you all up, right? But if I say, good morning, everybody, you know? So the way that you articulate things, the way that you express it, really, really, really makes an impact. And as musicians, as guitar players, as dancers, as singers, violin players, percussionists, whatever it may be, that is our goal. That is what we are trying to achieve. When you take a piece like this, like I mentioned earlier, and you have 10 people play it. By the time you heard that 10th person play it, you're like, okay, God, I got the melody in my head, I'm done with it. But if, ten, if the 10th player plays it slightly different than everybody else and plays it expressively and musically, it's like, I heard that piece for the first time. And that, again, is really kind of at the core of what the idea of the intentionality of musicality is and what I try to instill in my own playing and what I try to instill in my students to try to achieve, to try to aspire to play beyond just the dots on the page and looking at it as a mathematical kind of thing. Like, oh, okay, yeah, we got chord notes here, one, two, three, one, two, cookie cutter, cookie cutter. It's like, nah, I want to be expressive with it. I want to make those hairs on the back of people's necks stand up. Does this make sense? Is there any questions on any of this? On, on styles or how to kind of implement this into your own playing or the articulation of it or anything like that. It's clear. Okay, so I want to maybe try this with, um, and again, these pieces are just kind of arbitrary. It's not, even, it's not even the matter of what the piece is per se, but it's just the idea of using it as a baseline of how to implement these into your playing here. So, happy birthday, right? I was trying to pick pieces that hopefully everybody kind of knew. Um, and so this is, a, this is another example of, of maybe uh, a piece that I think, you know, should learn, you know, it's a great, it's a great piece, everybody knows it, right? Um, but if I play it in different ways, it's like, wow, I've heard a happy birthday every birthday, you know, I hear it every, every time I have a birthday. And so when I'm playing this, I'm like, okay, well, you know, and normally the people that are singing it, they're a bit off key, so, uh, <laughs> and you can play it for yourself and you can articulate it in, in, in very certain ways. So, if I take this and I just play it as written, you know, it's kind of like, okay, you know, It's like, it's like almost hearing it for the first time. So, when you're working through your music, again, think about these ideas of what we talked about today, the idea of articulation. The idea of phrasing, how I phrase it. You know, I, I did this thing kind of jokingly earlier where I played through a scale and I went. And you're like, you can sing it. You want to hear that, right? So it's like, I can do that with this. As the player, I'm like the driver, right? So I really can take my audience on any direction I want to go with it. If I want to play it lyrically, I can. If I want to play it more assertive and aggressive and punchy, I can. Imagine taking that happy birthday and playing it a staccato. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Right? And so it's like, oh, okay, it's like a happy birthday gift, but now it's like, okay, a happy birthday went staccato, right? So it was kind of an interesting way of how you can implement this into your own particular plane. So, with that being said, that is in conclusion 
of the program. So I hope that was helpful. Does anybody have any questions or answer or questions that I can give answers to? If you want, we can work through some of these, uh, especially you guys can come in a little bit um, after. We can work on these a little bit more. I can kind of go back and circle through with these again. Um, do you have any questions or anything, or does any any anything? Um, Curious about how to start putting this into your own playing and thinking about music more intentionally than just mechanics, you know. And like I was saying earlier, like I, I used to have this issue where, uh, you know, I'd, I'd work up a piece and I would play it for my teacher and like, man, I'm like, yeah, great, you got the piece down, play it to me musically. And it was just like the biggest like <laughs> moment because I'm like, man, uh, my teacher's name is Chris. I'm like, Chris, I worked all week on this. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, I worked my butt off on this piece. I'm like, yeah, great, play it musically. Made me feel something. And I was like, okay. And again, it took me several years to really figure out what that, what that really ultimately meant. And so very much of it has been so much of a self-discovery of listening to different players and, and listening to the same piece over and over again, but by multiple different people and seeing how um, things were phrased differently and, and how they were articulated. So yeah. I'd ask, can you do this on any guitar? Does it have to be... A nylon like yours, can you do it on a steel? No, oh, yeah, it can be anything. I mean, it, it's not it's not exclusive just just to nylon. In fact, um, uh, I'm also a steel string player, so uh, steel string you can you can achieve a lot uh, a lot of different so, uh, sound quality too. Um, the closer back to, towards the bridge as you go, the more of the, the brighter, brassier kind of punchy sound that you achieve, um, and that's kind of more amplified a bit more on uh, a steel string guitar. Um, <coughs> But yeah, that is that is that is what the reason why I love these instruments so much because there's just so much vocal like quality within it. Like I was saying earlier, the more that I play up in position, the more lyrical um, and vocal like I may get. As I move my hand down. So this piece that I played earlier, I'll just play the first, the first, um, the first uh, A section of it, um, and you'll be amazed at how much again that just by by moving the right hand up and down, how much of a difference that you get. So this piece, um, if I play it up in position, it's very very sweet, uh, and you get a very more lyrical. Nice little fender parlor. 
Okay, so let's do this all with open strings again, and I want to focus again on, so we, we did the dynamics a little bit, let's focus on the idea of the right hand, kind of like I just demonstrated earlier. So, what if we put our hand closer towards the front end of our sound hole, so more closer towards the fretboard. If I kind of put my hand in this position and I play these all just as um, double, But if I start to move it back, it's like I have this whole variety of tonal color. So I encourage you to try this right now. Try this with me. So let's start closer up in position. And as we get up towards the top of the strings, we're going to start to slowly move our way back. So that we so get jump down in position each string. Correct, yeah, correct. Right. Yeah. So let's do this together. Let's try it. Really nice and slow. Not to say that the other players aren't bad. They're great players in their own right. 
everybody, everyone is. But when I listen to certain players, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a, that's an individual that knows musicality. That's an individual that knows how to make something expressive. It makes me listen to a piece that I've heard a hundred times, but mm -hmm. makes me feel like I've heard it for the first time. And that was the idea of adding in the uh, the happy birthday and the ode to joy, taking something that everybody is familiar with, but trying to make it an interpretation of our own. So yeah. Yeah. Why? Why a few favorite players? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I would recommend checking out. Um, that's a great question. Wow. Because myself. I want to listen. To myself. You. <laughs> um, Besides yours. Oh yeah. I would check out uh, um, a gal named Anna Vidovich. What is she, it? She is from. Is she Croatian, Josh? I think she might. Anna Vidovich. I think she's uh, Russian. But we, oh I God! Can, I can check. How she, do you spell her last name? Oh, it is. D i d o v i c. D i d. O v i c. She is. Um, she's one of the uh, more modern players. She's uh, she's fairly young. Um, oh yeah, she's Croatian. Huh? Croatian, yeah, I thought she was okay. Croatian. Right, yeah. She's fantastic. Well, I think I was thinking of Tatiana Ruskova, yeah, okay. She's okay. a fantastic player. Um, beautiful, beautiful expression. Unreal. Um, very, very, very expressive. Every time I'm getting, getting goosebumps thinking about her. Um, during COVID, she was doing these, um, these concert series that were put on um, by different classical guitar um, associations and they were all live streamed and she's playing all these really really beautiful pieces and she's very very extremely expressive. Um, another individual is named David Russell. Uh, he's probably one of my top favorite players. Uh, if I, can I find a David Russell recording? I've listened to his quite a bit. Um, he lived in Spain for quite a while. I think he lives in the uh, US and Spain a little bit. He plays a lot in Spain. Um, if you check out some of the the Players that kind of really established the sense of musicality is like Andre Segovia. Um, some of his earlier recordings I like a lot more. Uh, he lived until he was pretty late in life. I think he was like 90 something yeah, when he right. passed. Um, he was still doing concerts when he was like 90 years old. This is a really, really cool, great hair, sitting with his guitar like this. Um, he's got some really, really good recordings too. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really, really fantastic players out there. Yeah. Any other questions? I want to hear some of your uh, favorite pieces. You want to hear some favorite pieces? Ooh, maybe I'll it's the, I'm as mysterious, maybe. Everybody loves mysterious. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can play a couple. Yeah, let me grab go. my... You want the Ramirez, though? Or you oh, no, that's favorite? okay. Let me grab my... Uh, I have a pedal here. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can play a couple pieces. Is there any other questions before I the though? Yeah, because I can play the rest of the day. But I, <laughs> it's not about the playing. It's, it's about... <laughs> And uh, there is actually one more person presenting after you, but we want you to play as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just play a couple pieces here. Um, sure. Can you please describe what this music piece is before you start? Yeah, yeah, yeah just please. Please. of course. It's kind of nice being able to do a presentation like this because in other recitals or recital situations, you play the pieces, you don't, you don't speak unless spoken to kind of thing. Uh, so it's kind of nice. Um, I'm going to play this, uh, this piece to kind of warm up here. Um, it's called Recuerdos de Alhambra, and it translates to Memories of the Alhambra. This is a piece written by Francisco um, Tarrega. And it is a very, very, very lyrical piece. Um, it's got this really, really amazing technique that kind of, really, this piece became kind of the staple um, for the technique. It's this idea of what we call tremolo. And tremolo is this idea where you have a reoccurring note that is simultaneously being played over and over and over and over again, where you have a melodic bass line um, underneath. So a lot of times, uh, it's kind of like if you take like a scale fragment, um, where you have a melody and you have a top line that just keeps going over and over again. So it's very tiring. After, after you do it a long enough, you're like, oh, your fingers are really tired. So you're just kind of, kind of going over and over again. Um, 
But yeah, this one is called Memories of the Alhambra, Recuerdos de la Alhambra. <laughs>
questions at the end. Um, and we do have somebody coming in um, behind us here too. This is probably my favorite piece out of the um, the Cassidy's Day Spiny Suite. Very, very melodic.